Welcome everyone to the Open Source Strategy Forum 2020. Um, this is our fourth edition. And once again, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to speak and connect with all of you to talk about the state of open source in financial services. And for the fourth year in a row, this is our fourth edition. We have a record number of attendees from across the globe. Um, I am thankful and very humbled to see the interest around this movement grow by the day, um, especially if you consider where, you start, where we started a few years ago. Um, while we wish we were greeting you in person this week, uh, and trust me, as an Italian, I'm feeling this 2020 and the lack of personal interaction particularly heavily. We're still very grateful to have you all joining us from virtually around the globe. Um, and we have what we think is an amazing event planned for you. So I hope you will enjoy. Uh, and you'll see up there, this is just the beginning. Uh, this is a recurring theme that you're going to hear throughout uh, the next two days. Again, uh, this is a very exciting time for our community, and I hope you will enjoy uh, the show. But first of all, uh, let me start thanking all of our sponsors um, with a special shout out to our leader sponsors, GitLab, IBM, and Red Hat, um, our contributor sponsor, Tidelift, and our community sponsor, TradeWeb. Um, this wouldn't be possible without you. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and to the attendees, make sure you connect with our sponsors. Uh, we have virtual booths in the event platform and we have our Slack channels. Uh, before we start, uh, um, let me give you a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping notes. Um, we have several ways for you to engage with our community. We'd love uh, not only for you to engage in the next couple of days, but hopefully to remain engaged and contribute to the Finos community. So uh, you should have received the Slack invite, uh, finos-lf.slack.com. Um, make sure uh, you engage in QA with the speakers during breakout sessions. And we have several uh, rooms where you can uh, uh, engage with our sponsors, with our community and with the speakers. Also, don't miss the ask, ask the Expert sessions, again, in Slack. Um, these are going to be very, very, hopefully useful areas where you can ask questions to the experts in our community. And finally, as I said, we'd love you to stay engaged. So uh, a great way to do that is to sign up to our uh, uh, community mailing list and start engaging, discussing with our community. Um, of course, if you think open source in financial services is great and there should be more of it, but maybe you can contribute directly, um, a great way for you to participate is to help amplifying our reach by spreading the word on social media. So you can see the uh, OS FinServe uh, hashtag, uh, which you can use, uh, as well as at Finos Foundation is our handle both on LinkedIn and uh, uh, Twitter. Um, Finally, uh, before we get started, uh, we want this to be a fun event for everyone. Uh, so please make sure that you uh, take a look at the Linux Foundation Code of Conduct and that you abide to that uh, throughout the day. Uh, it's linked at the bottom of this slide in case you don't know what it is. Uh, and if you see or experience any issue, please do get in touch with any one of the Finos or Linux Foundation staff on Slack, on email, uh, we'll be there to, to support and we appreciate your cooperation. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to invite our first uh, keynote speakers, uh, Dove Katz, our chair uh, from Morgan Stanley and Kim Prado, our vice chair from RBC. Dove, Kim, take it away. The Finos Governing Board includes representatives from the many type of companies that make up the financial service industry. This includes buy side and sell side financial firms, fintech companies, and open source technology and service firms. This diversity is essential in shaping strategy and direction. Representatives from these companies come from both technology and business areas, and this is key in shaping views and understanding how different projects will provide different value. Some technical projects, for example, include the cloud certification and assurance effort 
which ensure that infrastructure that we set up in the cloud has all the appropriate controls applied. Data transformation efforts with Goldman Sachs Legend Ecosystem and synthetic data management with Cities Data Hub Project are two other examples of tech projects going on within the foundation. Defining standards to share financial objects between desktop applications, regulatory technology in the FinOS Open Reg Tech Initiative, expressing business logic Project in a way that can generate code in projects like Morgan Stanley's Morpher are just more examples. Board members perform the dual role of driving interest within their own firms and working closely with the foundation staff and other board members to identify and share industry challenges that can be addressed by open source solutions with real potential to impact the industry in a great way. The diversity of views and the trust to speak openly with peers who may also be your competitors, like Joe, for example, is a critical factor in driving the direction of the foundation. In our last governing board meeting, we took a step further and established a FINOS Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Ali will talk more about this later this morning. Last year, when Ali and I were on stage, Gap mentioned that we had reached the chasm. 2020 has been a blockbuster year for Finos, and we've definitely crossed that chasm, validating our several years of hard work and partnership. We finally hit the tipping point where financial institutions make up the majority of code and project contributions. Our relevance in the industry was validated when we joined forces this year with the Linux Foundation, and code contributions reached a record high of 1,500 last month. We had about an order of magnitude less last year, and this shattered our previous record by 40%. We are really excited to have joined the Linux Foundation as their financial services umbrella. Finos has always approached accelerating open source and financial services from multiple angles, supporting firms as they establish their policies and procedures around open source contribution, providing a trusted neutral platform from a technical view, as well as a cultural and strategic one, sharing experiences and opportunities, and providing a home for open source projects and standards that have particular relevance to the financial services industry. As Joe mentioned, we're seeing this approach pay off with increased contributions and engagement from banks. Some banks making their first contribution as they find that tipping point that they did last year, while others are making their third, fourth, and beyond and are becoming more streamlined. Firms are recognizing the benefits of leveraging Finos projects. Later today, I'll be speaking about Perspective, which was originally contributed by JP Morgan. Others are getting the internal buy-in to take the next steps. This increased visibility is also driving interest. Innovation and DevOps SIGs are two examples where we're drawing both wide interest and new participants. New participants and partnerships and collaboration with organizations who recognize Spinos potential to help further a common cause, such as ISDA and AIR collaborations that are on the table, and partnerships emerging at home within the Linux Foundation where there is now a more devoted focus on the financial services industry. Open source and financial services is a reality because it's good for individuals and it's good for companies. It's good for business. We're pleased to be involved with Finos and this conference and hope it gives you some idea of what open source and financial services can do as well as some of the exciting things that are happening within the foundation. If you're not already involved in a Finos project, then please do ask us or any of the Finos team, or check online about how you can be. Well, thank you, Kim, and thank you, though, for sharing your experience and perspective on the growth of our community. Uh, and, you know, most importantly, thank you for the support, the advice, and the leadership in changing the status quo in this industry. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible without you. So today, before I leave the stage to much smarter folks than I am, I wanted to give you all an update on our community uh, and more broadly the state of open source and financial services. And spoiler alert, uh, the state of our community is as strong as it's ever been. Um, we've seen a record amount of contributions this year uh, and I'm glad to report that the vast majority of these contributions are coming from financial institutions something completely unheard of even a little over two years ago when we started Finos. Um, this is an important milestone for us, but before we look ahead at the opportunities that we think uh, this opens up for the industry, uh, let's take a quick trip down memory lane. 
in fact, when we started Venus two years ago, or even further, when we started the Symphony Software Foundation four years ago, um, as I pitched the idea of open source collaboration in the industry, a highly siloed and regulated industry, let's just say that the reaction was, you know, less than lukewarm. Um, you know, and that's understandable. It's an industry that not only has to abide to strict regulations, but that it culturally can be very competitive. Uh, not just across firms, but also within firms. Not only there were several myths that, uh, uh, you know, about open source that needed to be debunked, uh, but there were concrete legal, uh, technical and strategic reasons to prevent even internal collaboration models like, for example, inner source, let alone open source collaboration across firms. So that's when we started our open source readiness initiative, which paired, uh, you know, if you pair that with the changing nature of this industry and the forces uh, that we'll touch upon a little later, that has delivered major progress in how financial services can now collaborate through open source. And since we started, we've seen an amazing progression. I mean, just take a look. Um, when we started in 2016, we were focused on collaborating on a single platform, Symfony. Uh, the platform was originally born out of an investment uh, out of the largest financial institutions, pretty much all the bulge bracket banks uh, out there, uh, and based on a contribution from Goldman Sachs, uh, their internal collaboration platform called Live Current. Uh, and the idea behind that was that an open source foundation could be the neutral place to build an ecosystem on Symfony, and the inherent transparency of open source would increase adoption and acceptance by other financial institutions, fintechs, and regulators. So you see, even four years ago, um, there was a spark of this idea of open source collaboration. But then it was 2017 when our platinum member Deutsche Bank contributed Plexus, uh, a battle-tested messaging bus used uh, in their Autobahn single dealer platform that Effectively, that was the spark that made us realize that maybe, uh, you know, just maybe we could leverage the trust and the network that we had built in our community to collaborate not just on Symfony, uh, but to leverage open source uh, to address really long standing technology challenges and collaboration challenges across the industry. Uh, you know, and that's when we uh, hosted our inaugural OSSF. And there we heard loud and clear the message from the industry. Over 400 uh, folks validating this idea and pushing us to, you know, expand our remit. And so that's when we launched Finos in 2018. The Symphony Software Foundation became Finos. We added amazing representation from other financial institutions, from technology firms, and we also started seeing, you know, quickly uh, the power of this collaboration model. Uh, in, for example, standards like FDC3, our uh, interoperability standard, moving quickly to deliver releases. This was a really early sign that we were, you know, on the right track. But then 2019 was really pivotal for us. Um, we received what, you know, to date uh, is still our most stared project on GitHub. Um, you know, perspective. This was a real-time visualization library contributed by JP Morgan. Uh, and we continue to bring, you know, the industry along with our open source readiness program. And we culminated the year with the largest OSSF to date last year. Um, you know, everyone I spoke with uh, felt a unique energy last year of a community being born. Uh, very much looking forward to what we could do together. Well, and then 2020 stroke, um, you know, the silver lining is uh, this has actually massively accelerated, uh, you know, if you think uh, uh, how much now firms are comfortable uh, with remote and distributed teams, very much, you know, the open source default mode of operation, uh, this has really resulted in uh, strong membership growth, our project portfolio has grown, uh, uh, drastically this year in 2020 with contributions from, you know, Goldman Sachs, Citi, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Nomura, pretty much all of our 
uh, uh, platinum members and financial institutions are now actively engaged in contributions. And let's not forget, we joined the Linux Foundation. This has been an amazing year for us as we partner with the bigger family, the larger family of the Linux Foundation, which is also, by the way, helping us produce this event today. This has been an amazing partnership and we look forward to what this can bring to the industry and beyond over the next years. But before we talk about our projects and you know the major progress we've done there this year, I want to send a shout out to our members. Um, you know, today we are 38 members strong and you know, all of this wouldn't have been possible without you. Uh, without your support, without your funding, without the sweat equity you put every single day to grow this community. And so every time I look at this slide, I am incredibly proud of having such a corporate representation spanning from you know, financial institutions to fintechs, uh, from technology companies to other consortium nonprofits we're now partnered with. Uh, a representation that keeps growing in diversity uh, as we look to engage very much every constituent of this ecosystem. On this note, I am very proud to announce today the addition of three new corporate members to our family. Today, we're welcoming Susie and Intel as gold members. Um, I'm very excited to have such open source leaders joining our foundation and very much look forward to working with them. We're also announcing DiffBlue is joining us as a silver member out of the UK, once again, showing the true global nature of our community. And finally, please join in welcoming uh, uh, these corporate members to our community. Make sure you connect them today, today through the different collaboration channels that we have available at these companies. But that's not all. Today, Finos is also announcing the creation of, free, uh, of the free of charge uh, associate membership program. Uh, it's targeted for nonprofits, industry consortia, governmental and academic institutions, and we're actually welcoming our inaugural three associate members to Finos. I'm very proud to announce that AIR, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, is partnering us to involve regulators in our open source endeavors. Um, and uh, uh, you're going to hear about it much more tomorrow, um, you know, from our COO, Tasha Ellison, and, and the AIR team. Uh, we're also welcoming today the Interwork Alliance to our community, um, excuse me, Interwork Alliance, to ensure that our standardization efforts can span across the world uh, of decentralized technologies. Uh, finally, last but not least, we also formalized our associate membership with ISDA, the International Swaps and Derivatives Association, with whom we already partnered throughout 2020 uh, on the legend pilots, uh, formerly known as Alloy, uh, to make changes to their common domain model and successfully hosted uh, collaboration on this powerful modeling platform. So what's the common thread here? Um, Finas and the experience we built is now recognized as an enabler for other institutions, for other nonprofits and consortia in the industry that are maybe less familiar with open source. And we think we can help accelerate their progress. You know, we're here to help, to consolidate, not to fragment. Now, I just mentioned legend. Um, and so if you haven't followed the news lately, let me give you a quick reminder. Uh, and again, spoiler alert. This was a huge deal for us at Finos, for our community, and for the industry at large. Um, if you were here last year, you remember that Goldman Sachs announced the intent to open source their Alloy modeling platform uh, and the underpinning language called Pure. Uh, so I'm really happy to report that this process of open sourcing completed in October uh, with the contribution of the platform, which is now referred to as Legend. Um, this is a huge step for Goldman, for our community, for the industry at large. Not only we expect you know, other financial institutions to start adopting the platform that Goldman uses for all sorts of modeling, from regulatory to pricing, um, but we have seen a great potential in Finos actually hosting a legend instance, which has been already by, used by over a hundred uh, modelers to collaborate 
uh, on common pan-industry um, standardization efforts. So check it out, download it, contribute to it. And if you'd like to try it, uh, uh, we are hosting our legend sandbox. So go to finos.org slash legend and we can get you set up. But it's not just about legend. Um, you know, as I mentioned over the last two years, our project portfolio has grown to include so many high value and high quality projects for this industry. After all, financial institutions, you know, should be no surprise, financial institutions have massive technology organizations and amazing software components that when contributed can deliver immediate value to the industry. So we talked about legend from Goldman Sachs. We touched on the perspective visualization library originally contributed by JP Morgan. But while I won't be able to discuss here uh, the over 40 projects in our landscape, there's a couple of projects I wanted to highlight to showcase the depth and the breadth of our community. Waltz, for example, uh, was contributed this year by Deutsche Bank. It's a very mature active project uh, that allows you to visualize and define your organization technology landscape. Um, when you think about the sheer size of these financial institutions, well, you can easily see how this project has a massive potential to be used across the industry. Um, I also wanted to send out a shout out to the Morpher team, uh, a project that was contributed earlier this year by Morgan Stanley. Um, this project aims to represent your domain model and your business logic in a technology agnostic fashion. And we can see great potential here for standardizing some of the common challenges required across the industry. For example, an area where we're seeing very high potential is the regulatory angle, uh, where Morphe could be used to define common regulatory implementations. And last but not least, uh, just a shout out uh, we quickly talked about our FDC3 standard, which stands for Financial Desktop Collaboration and Connectivity Consortium. This is probably the most mature standard we have in Finos. Uh, uh, in case you don't know, yes, we do also open standards, not just open source projects. Um, this standard has reached its 1.1 version, it's very mature, and is being increasingly implemented by both vendors and financial institutions developing applications internally to harmonize uh, the ecosystem of these applications, not only on the you know, front office, on the trader's desktop, but also in the mid office and back office. So it's a very powerful standard and we think it's gonna help bring together uh, you know, a previously largely disconnected ecosystem of applications. Um, and make sure, again, I couldn't cover all the 40 projects here, but make sure you check out the landscape uh, the over 40 projects in the Finos landscape at landscape.finos.org. Um, if you are engaged in other Linux Foundation projects, you probably are familiar with the landscape. Uh, so please check it out and we're hopefully going to see you contributing to some of these projects. So given the growth that we had this year, it should be no surprise that in October 2020, uh, you know, October 2020 has marked the all-time high in number of commits to the Finos community. Um, not only that, but in 2020, over 70% of our projects contributed came from financial institutions. I'll stop a second to let that one sink in. I mean, this is an industry that has historically struggled to collaborate, and we think this is an amazing achievement. But as much as I'd love to credit the, the Finos community and our team for the relentless work done with our open source readiness initiative, and trust me, that has massively helped several of our members to get through the hump and start contributing. The truth is the industry is living a seismic shift and the context we're moving in in 2020 makes open source in this industry not only strategic, but almost a foregone conclusion. So let's have a look at some of these forces. Why is this industry now seemingly suddenly embracing open source contribution and collaboration? Well, first and foremost, the business context we are moving in has drastically changed over the last 10 years. Um, not only you know, the advent of electronic trading uh, uh, and just 
generally very highly competitive market has driven spreads and margins to their historical lows, um, impacting the top line. Uh, but if you look at the bottom line, the regulatory spend has steadily increased over the last 10 years. So there simply is no longer a quasi infinite amount of money to be thrown at the problem. And if you pair that with a mandate uh, to become technology companies, and more generally to deliver customer centric solution for the digitally native uh, new generation, well, then you can see that the business imperatives point to a much stronger need for efficiency and a tech native approach. On the other side of the equation, the technology landscape has drastically evolved over the last 10 years and presenting really new opportunities. Um, cloud, first and foremost, which by the way, itself, I believe it wouldn't exist without open source and the advent of the centralized technologies, which are in a way threatening the very notion of these large centralized financial institutions. And if you add to that equation, the increased talent crunch the industry is experiencing for both older technologies like mainframe and most importantly for new technologies, you realize why the industry is looking very seriously now to tap it into the ocean of talent that exists in open source communities. And if you pair that, those business and technology drivers with the tensions of an ecosystem, a landscape that is still largely divided between the up and coming fintechs on one hand, uh, who really target to deliver a drastically new user experience as their differentiator. And on the other hand, incumbent vendors still having a dominant position in the market. Uh, and continue to leverage in that. Um, again, if you pair that with the growing number of new generation technologies who are called in senior and executive positions in banks, coming with a strong open source experience, um, you know, grown in years of delivering technology, quote unquote, on the West Coast, uh, then you realize that really open source is here to stay. But make no mistake, this is just the beginning. I wanna draw a parallel, uh, of course, as an Italian, to a love relationship. Uh, I think that where we are now is, you know, being happily married after years of dating, in a way through large consumption of open source, but limited contribution. And so what now? Well, like any marriage, now the goal is to nurture this relationship. It's not going to be easy. Each side will have to give something up, but the reward will be able to will be to be able to collaborate um, to create solutions for some of the long-standing challenges in this industry. This is the imperative. This is just the beginning, and it behooves on us as a community to leverage this amazing community that we've built and go after higher order challenges. So that brings me to, to the road ahead. Um, I think first of all, as I said, we have an opportunity to seize. And by far, I don't expect this to us to only make an impact in financial services. It's no longer a mirage to think that, you know, with this community that we have and the representation from the largest financial institutions in the world, we can make an impact beyond our business problems into areas like sustainability, financial inclusion, diversity, which continue to be massive problems. Um, in order to do that, we need to build a commercial ecosystem around the open source projects that we have. Uh, and we think there is a huge first mover advantage there for fintechs that are gonna jump in and repeat what we have seen happening in pretty much any other industry, uh, commercializing open source. Um, but in order to do that, we need to continue nurturing our projects in the open. Um, you know, as you all well know, it doesn't just take to throw code in GitHub to make a project successful. And so it is our imperative to work together with our contributors to make our projects wildly adopted and contributed to. And the way we're going to do that is to really embrace all constituents in our community. We are a global and inclusive community. And as you hear a, a lot tomorrow, we're doing a lot of work to include the regulators, to include you know, the global uh, uh, financial institutions, all the other industry consortia, as you've heard today. So, so much work ahead, 
but we see a major opportunity here. And finally, I wanna close with this. Open source in financial services is a positive sum game. Let's be clear, nobody will have the time, the attention, the resources or the goodwill to just do open source for the public good and see it through. But the good news is that there are massive opportunities, commercial opportunities for each individual constituent, whether you're a bank, a fintech, a big tech or cloud service provider, or even a regulator. Because as you go after those opportunities, the open source way enables all of us together to create faster innovation, better interoperability, data standardization, a truly open fintech ecosystem, and definitely mitigate the risk market-wide. I think these are all very worthy goals, we think. And so we do hope you'll enjoy the next two days. And after that, you'll join our community and contribute to our projects. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you do enjoy this conference. Now, let me move, as I said, to much smarter folks than me. Our next speaker this morning is Managing Director at Goldman Sachs and Lead Architect of the recently open source project Legend, uh, is Pierre de Belen. In addition, he co-manages Goldman's uh, data platform team, which was responsible for developing data-centric and user-focused solution to power the firm's data strategy. Today, he joins us to share details about open sourcing legend, the flagship of, open, of Goldman Sachs data strategy, and maybe now yours. Uh, please welcome Pierre de Belen. Hello, my name is Pierre de Belen, and I manage the data model engineering department at Goldman Sachs. We just completed the first phase of open sourcing the Legend platform by contributing its code to the Finos Foundation. I'd like to thank the whole Finos team for their help and their support throughout this journey. Today, I'm going to give a high-level overview of our platform and describe several of its use cases. Some can be implemented with the code currently available on our GitLab projects while others may require code that will be available in upcoming contributions. As you may know, the problem of data management in finance are less related to the volume of data processing than they are related to the fragmentation of our data and the incredible amount of actors participating in the finance processing flow, creating communication issues, processing breaks, and other inefficiencies. Legend is the data management platform that provides solutions to these problems by focusing on data discovery, helping technical and non-technical users to find data, data transformation, linking information together and building a leverageable lineage graph, data quality, improving quality checks all along the processing pipelines, and data delivery making it possible for all actors to easily and safely acquire data. However, it is sometimes better to define something by what it is not than by what it is. In this respect, Legend is not a data analytics platform. It does integrate with existing analytics environment like Python and R, and also business intelligence tools like Tableau and Clickview. It is meant to help users organize and transform their data so that it can be easily and safely delivered to these platforms. What does safely mean? It means that users will have more confidence that the data they are retrieving is what they expected. They, this is thanks to the transparent lineage. That the quality is appropriate. This is thanks to the centralized and collaborative definition of constraints enforced as early as possible in the transformation flow that users only see what they are authorized to see, respecting data sensitivity and privacy. All these functions are made possible by effectively managing metadata, 
we ensure that the metadata is always up to date and accurate because it's driving the execution flows. So let's look at the tools that constitute the platform. The platform relies on two servers, the SDLC server and the engine server. Both of them can be seen at the bottom of the diagram. Let's look at them in more detail. First, the SDLC server. It currently provides a driver to the GitLab product, which manages the lifecycle of our metadata. SDLC is key to our platform, as most of our metadata ends up being leveraged in production flow. Having the proper level of audit and review is critical to operating our environments and also to meet the requirements of our auditors and regulators. The platform also relies on the engine server that prov provides functions like grammar parsing. It converts the pure language into an abstract syntax tree that are returned as JSON structure. The pure language is a legend modeling language. It is used to describe structural models, but it is also describing queries, constraints, check of transforms within the mapping DSLs and data derivations. The engine also provides a compilation API that provides feedback about errors that could have been made during code writing. Another important engine feature is also to provide query execution, leveraging three important inputs. First, a function representing the query, then a mapping that maps types expressed in the query to elements of a data source, and finally, a runtime that provides a way to connect to a data source. We will cover this use case in a little bit more details later in the presentation. Finally, the engine provides APIs for model transformation. Example would be generating from a model a JSON schema or Java code. JSON schemas can be leveraged to validate serialization or to define contracts in data servicing using Swagger or OpenAPI, for example. The two servers enable several client applications that help users during their journey working with data. First, a cube environment that provides simple relational-like queries with operations such as filter, join, or group by. It is mainly used to investigate new data that we could acquire from vendors or by looking at legacy databases. When investigations are done and users decide to invest in their data, then they graduate to Studio. Studio allows them to build models that document the semantic of the data and mapping that binds modeled information to data source. This provides APIs that can be leveraged by a large number of users and that can be maintained for a long time period. Once the models and mappings to data sources are created in Studio, users can leverage the query tool to easily access data. They don't have to remember any localized knowledge required to join a trade to a product that they would have using Cube. They can also write any graph query they can imagine without being blocked by a static service layer. And finally, if users want to leverage their query programmatically, they can publish it to the service tool. It pre-calculates the necessary query plans and enables self-service operational support. Now that you're familiar with the legend and its components, let's go over some use cases. Let's start with the derivatives use case. It was one of the main motivations behind the open sourcing of our platform. The derivative flow is complex because derivative contracts evolve frequently, have deeply complex tangled structures, are processed by many different parties within each firm and also outside each firm, which means that derivative contracts are leveraging different schemas and thus require transformations. They are built with different technologies as many of these processing steps were built at different times and also require different query engine capabilities. They require many validations to encode all the knowledge and requirements of all actors. To illustrate these facts and looking at the diagram, 
booking and quote require simple data entry schemas. These schemas need to be available for service technologies so that, for example, they can be easily externally available to clients. Third, the model needs to be transformed to API language like Swagger or OpenAPI. Price and risk need to interface with calculators that may require deeper integration than services in order to perform calculation optimization. Clearing will require interfacing with external standards like FPML or CDN. Reg reporting schemas are optimized to report information across assets and thus are represented in a really different way than the original contract structure. How does Legend improve these flows? First, by letting users express models that can be converted to different technologies in a central environment. By defining mappings between the different models. By letting any users define constraints that can be enforced anywhere in the flow. For example, back office can define constraints enforced at booking time. And by finally operating all these models and transforms in a strong SDLC to optimize communication among the different teams and to accelerate the potential modifications and improvement of financial terms. The current open source code can operate this use case. However, as I'm speaking, we still have to contribute transformations like pure to Rosetta or pure to JSON schema and also the integration with the GitLab build pipeline so that the creation of artifacts and the execution of tests can be done automatic automatically. Both will come shortly in the next weeks. Another use case heavily used in our environment is a self-service data access use case. Once a model and a mapping to a data source have been defined in Studio, users can leverage the query tool to easily access information. People often ask me, why is it easier to formulate a query using models than it is using the data source directly? First, data sources have many different query languages. It may be hard to train all your users to know them all, especially business users that may not have the time or the interest to do so. Second, the model provides safeguards during query creation and makes data access simple. It also helps users not to waste time on things that are not necessary during query creation. For example, how to te technically navigate from a position to an account, especially if they are stored in different systems or the navigation requires a complex join expression. Let me illustrate that with an example. Let's look at product and synonyms. It looks like a pretty simple example that is an important building block in the finance data space. Let's look at their database representation, focusing on information that defines their relationship. A product will have many synonyms, and that's why the synonym table contains a product ID key. As we can already see, the information is encoded in a technical way and can already frighten non-technical users. This is usually because databases use historical convention mostly understood and managed by DBAs. Let's go through the process of modeling the tables to remove ambiguity about data access. So the first thing to do is to create the concepts we are interested in so we can create product and synonym. We can already see that the properties are clearer to users. We represent the relationship between product and synonyms as a property named synonyms. This is already interesting as joining two tables is never as simple as joining a primary key to a foreign key. There's always something else to think about. So, the, so we provide these models to users and we let them query. The first feedback is that they want to easily and quickly get one specific synonym using the model. So we can modify the model and add a qualifier. It makes it clear that you can get one synonym out of the related synonym set given a synonym type. 
So the model start to carry more information than the initial tables. So we give it to our users and they come back saying that the model is broken and that they had multiple products come in when they filtered products for a specific synonym. This is because not all synonyms are global. They do have different scopes. Some are valid for a market, some for a region, and some are global. So we impose the model. I illustrate only for global and market synonym, but the same principle scales for different scopes. Now, users are protected by the API and understand that in order to access a market synonym without any ambiguity, they will also need to provide a financial market. The model comes with far more depth and documentation than just the raw tables and is more suited to ease self-service and is as built in answers to usual, usual, usual questions. Now that we have a model, users can easily access information by walking the graph and define a tree that univocally qualified the information. We can see that something called simply price in a grid can be fully qualified as the stop price of the last order version, for example, which avoids miscommunications and error. This is exactly what the query tool enables users to do. This use case requires the model to database, database mapping capability that will be available by Q1 2021 and the query tool that will be made available by Q4 2021. Thank you so much for your attention. If you want more information, you can find some on our microsite at legend.finos.org and please don't hesitate to check out our code on our GitHub repositories. Well, thank you, Pierre, for the very cool presentation and the amazing overview of Legend. Um, and since I'm here, I want to thank you and the whole Goldman team for the passion to get this platform contributed. I know it's been hard work, but it's also been an amazing experience for our team to work with you. Um, and one thing I want to point out for the community, and it's probably very worth pointing out, is that Goldman Sachs is now effectively developing Legend in an open first fashion. Uh, that means that development happens in the canonical source uh, in the open, in our Finos GitHub organization. Um, this is a key element of an open source project, which is aiming to engage effectively its community. So please, everyone, make sure you check out legend.finos.org. And if you'd like to try the platform, go to finos.org slash legend. We're hosting a sandbox instance. Moving on. Our next speaker is an enterprise DevOps evangelist and a product marketing leader at GitLab. He is a multifaceted IT software leader with 20 years of IT leadership and software experience. Uh, today, John, we talk about how innovation plus security equals customer joy and how you can stop sacrificing customer experience for security. Please welcome John Jeremiah. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here for this year's Open Source Strategy Forum. I'd like to spend a few minutes this morning and talk about how innovation and security together can help you deliver customer joy. My name is John Jeremiah, and I'm an IT leader and a developer, and I currently work at GitLab as part of the product marketing team. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can share some insight about things we've learned at GitLab and things that will help you. So I'd like to start by say, at talking about what is customer experience anyway? You know, first off, it's important I think to realize that a great customer experience is really not a destination. Rather, it's a journey because the customer's expectations, they continuously change as does your organization. So you have to really get to know your customers and their needs, and you have to really double click into understanding what really matters to them and then measure that. Now, knowing what they want is really the first step, but what the hard work really is in the transformation that you have to do of getting your business to align to meet their expectations. It requires the business, the IT, the technology side, the product side, all of the organization has to align 
to deliver an exceptional customer experience. And then the last part of this really is, it's about improving and iterating. Because as soon as you've implemented the changes, customers' expectations, they too will probably change. So you have to be prepared to always improve and to get better. But what do customers really want? I mean, I think it's important to realize that many organizations, there's a huge gap between you know, what customers expect and what they really get. You know, according to Gardner, they, they re, written research says almost two thirds of organizations are focusing on competing on a better customer experience. And by the way, that's doubled from just 10 years ago when it was about a third. And that means that if you're not focusing on how to deliver an exceptional customer experience, you probably should be. You know, in many ways, your customers are looking for an opportunity and experience that delivers joy. They want suggestions and ideas to help them be more productive. They want a personalized experience. At the end of the day, they want something more than what all too often they're not getting. Because, you know, if you think about what they really get and what you really experience, it's, there's a gap. I mean, think about it. last time you had a robocall where there was a voice response system on the other end frustrating or when an app or a system was updated and changed and now it doesn't address your needs and made things harder. You know, these kind of experiences, they all add up one after the other and they have a lasting impact, either strengthening the relationship with your customers, between customers and the brands or weakening. And it, it, it doesn't have to be negative. In fact, you all have the power to change it and improve it. And so I wanna talk about what I think are three things to consider as you look at how do you improve your customer experience. And first off, it's velocity. You have to be able to move as quickly as the market in order to keep up both with your customer's expectations and, and whatever else the competition is doing. Second is you have to address the reality that trust and security and privacy really are paramount. There are table stakes in building and strengthening a relationship between your brand and your customers. And lastly, you know, the ability to innovate, to deliver new value that surprises and delights your customers is really how you're going to be able to differentiate yourself from the competition. So I'd like to unpack it and, and double click into it because I think it's important to understand that velocity, for example, isn't just about going fast but it's about going fast with purpose and with controls and intention. And at GitLab, where we've been, where we're part of this amazing open source community building you know, GitLab the product, we've been practicing high velocity from the very beginning. You know, we deploy over 3000 times a day to gitlab.com. And as a product, we've delivered over a hundred consecutive monthly releases where we always, almost always include hundreds of changes and updates and contributions from our community. See, Velocity is what's helping us to deliver an amazing customer experience for our customers. And, and I wanna share with you some keys as to how do we go as fast as we go. First off, is we practice what I would consider to be radical transparency. We work with our community, our customers, and with each other in ways that are open and transparent. By being open, we're able to collaborate on our roadmap and our strategy. We're able to collaborate on new ideas and features. And together, we build a better solution. And because we're open, the transparency, it builds trust. The second thing we're doing, which is I think also you know, radical and it's an extreme is a form of iteration. We've embraced the concept of what we call minimum viable change. We've got, it's way beyond the idea of a minimum viable product, but rather it's a minimum viable change of what's the smallest change that will make something better, will improve it. Now in practice, minimum viable change is incredibly hard to do, but when you've mastered it, you're able to implement small changes, get feedback and keep moving rather than what typically happens in organizations where ideas get stuck. They get stuck in review, they get stuck in the process, and they never ever see the light of day. At GitLab, we move really fast because of minimum viable change. Now, if you're gonna move fast, you've gotta have the ability to eliminate the bottlenecks and barriers and automation, I think is, is absolutely one of the most important things to embrace. In GitLab, we embrace pipelines for continuous integration, continuous delivery to, to remove the bottlenecks and to streamline the flow of innovation to production. 
That's how we build in quality and reduce risk across the, the whole journey. So that way we're testing everything an exceptionally large number of times, including security testing and security scans and all sorts of steps in the pipeline to speed things up and lower risk. The last thing I think that's really, really important to make sure that is clear is that at GitLab, we don't build things and do things in a static way, but rather you have to embrace the spirit of continuous improvement or in my Lean Six Sigma days, the idea of Kaizen, of continuous improvement. We practice continuous improvement in everything we do. And in fact, when we do uncover and learn new things and share that, we publish it. We publish it in our handbook for everyone else in the community to be aware of. And we publish it in the form of videos and other interactions where, where we're always being self We're always thinking about how do we make this better over time? And those lessons learned then is what we build upon to go faster. Now, you know, it's, it's one thing to talk about velocity, but you, you can't go fast and, and do it at the risk of security, at the risk of quality. And so you have to deliver value fast. And to do this, you've got to promote and embrace security at all levels of the organization across the whole life cycle. You have to think about the security of your data, the security of your applications, the security of your infrastructure. And from an application perspective, you need to ensure that security is baked in from the very beginning as a requirements to giving developers immediate feedback. And in the world of DevOps, we would call this you know, shift left security. The, the, the idea is that you don't want developers and people to wait for security at the very end, which has been the way security has traditionally been developed, delivered, but rather you want to have security baked in upfront so developers get fast and immediate feedback about what they're delivering. You also want to embrace automation to help streamline compliance so that way your applications are shipped in a way that's compliant and ready so that way you're not running the risk of jeopardizing the privacy of your customers information or risking their trust now at the end of the day the ultimate goal is really to deliver innovation and joy you're trying to deliver capabilities that surprise and delight your customers you know think about the last time when a brand did that and delivered something that surprised you you know, for example, I, as a former frequent flyer, I used to travel a lot. I would like to get back to doing it. But it was an amazing experience the first time when an employee came up to me and recognized me by name out of the thousands of passengers they deal with. And they had the data. And it was a way of, of a great personal touch and it strengthened my loyalty. So you have to really understand your customers and what they expect and deliver that for them. You know, in many ways, what we're really trying to do is achieve an amazing experience for our customers, an experience where we are, where we're fast and delivering value that's safe and exciting in a way that strengthens that relationship. And you can do this thing, you can do this. You know, I've been in the position at GitLab where we have succeeded in doing this with our customers. When I would go to conferences and events, you know, the, in the real world, when we used to go to physical events, it was so common to have members of our community and customers come up to the booth and, and they, they would want to hug us. And I don't mean in a socially distant smile or a wave or a nod, but really hug us because they were so fond of everything that we did to help them deliver. And if we can do it, so can you. The relationship you're building with your customers will deliver delight and innovation and value from them. And you're going to have a relationship with your customers that will stand the test of time. At GitLab, we've been doing this. We've been building a solution. If you don't know what GitLab is, we're an application that helps software developers and teams build and deliver software. We cover the whole life cycle in a single solution. And it helps people to deliver at high speed without sacrificing security. It's all about how you deliver innovation faster than ever. But this isn't about really GitLab. This is about you and how you can do the change to improve your customer's experience. I'd love to connect with you, all of you or any of you in the future on LinkedIn. Have a wonderful conference and thank you so much for the time. Good. Well, thank you, John, for your insights. And let me thank you also GitLab for being such a valuable gold member of Finas and having been so functional in supporting us in open sourcing legend. Next on. Uh, joining us is uh, Alejandra Villagra. 
She's managing director in the markets and securities uh, services division of City. She's also the head of City Velocity, City number one's ranked digital platform for institutional clients. Ali uh, has been an invaluable leader of Finas, representing City on our board since its very inception, and then in her tenure, first as a vice chair and then chair of our board. Not only that, but Ali has been a huge advocate of our movement in our firm, which is now actively contributing more broadly for open source in this industry. Earlier this year, Ali has also stepped up to chair our diversity and inclusion committee, who's working to advise Finas on concrete actions we can take to grow diversity in our team, our board, and our community. This is a fundamental area where concrete action is needed now, as diversity remains a huge issue, both in financial services and in the open source community. So Ali joins us today to talk about building an inclusive community by sharing her own personal experience. Please join me in welcoming Ali Villagra. Hi everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here with you all today, albeit over Zoom, not, not as good as in person, but um, a pleasure nonetheless. I'm absolutely delighted um, and honored to be here to speak with you a bit about uh, Finos diversity and inclusion efforts and a little bit of my own experience in the space as well. So with that, I'll get to it. The first time I stepped onto City's trading floor, I was completely awestruck, excited, and beyond intimidated. I studied social sciences at Dartmouth. And to be honest, I did not know what a stock or a bond was. I did corporate recruiting because it seemed my 21-year-old self lazy not to, and since my friends were. Then lo and behold, I'm in New York City at a final round interview talking about a world I barely knew even existed. There's a lot that is fuzzy about that day, but three things stood out. Number one, the trading floor. It was intense. Number two, an extremely kind, extremely kind administrative assistant named Ellen, who must have read the terror on my face because she complimented the new bag that I bought from a big day. And number three, my interview with a very confident, very warm and very pregnant SUNY Harford. Almost on the spot, I knew that I was meeting a new North Star. That day, SUNY took an incredibly important place in my heart and in my brain because I wanted to be just like her. She had important clients, she was the boss of a big team, and yeah, apparently she was about to be a mom too. And there was her name. Oh, SUNY, what was it? I didn't know, I didn't ask. I just knew that on some level, it was like my name. It was different, but here she was. So preparing for this talk, and in fact, right now, uh, made me really, really nervous. I knew from the moment that I said yes, I was gonna stress about it until it was over. I also knew that I absolutely needed to say yes to be visible in the way I'm asking my colleagues at Finos, at City, and in the broader open source community to make efforts to see that underrepresented people are visible. So here I am. After stressing about saying yes, I quickly moved on to stressing about what I could possibly say to you all over Zoom, in a pandemic, and in a moment of reckoning with racial injustice. Everything I could think to say just seemed really unimportant on a relative basis. So finally, I settled in on what I know best, my own story. My tiny, tiny sliver of an experience that might personalize for you all why representation matters, how it happens, how it shaped my career and brought me to you today. Since that day, when I first met SUNY on the trading floor, I've had a lot of ups and downs in my career, like everyone. I've had moments of pride. I've had moments of disappointment. I've had times when I was sure I would not make it in the world of finance and moments when I knew this was exactly the right place for me. 
But this talk is about representation and why it matters through my eyes. And the story I'm telling is about how important it's been to me each step of the way to see a person I aspire to be. It is proof, hard data, evidence that it can be done. The list of reasons my career has been successful is full of intentional interventions. It's full of luck, setbacks, successes, and my own stubborn competitive nature. And while SUNY and other senior women have been my North Stars, I have benefited enormously from men who've been fierce advocates and mentors, who've taken chances on me and put their faith into my abilities. I've also worked with incredible teams, women, men, black, East Asian, Indian, white, straight, gay colleagues who have poured their talents into our shared goals. And more importantly, who believed in me as a leader. They believed in me as a leader and in doing so created a self-fulfilling prophecy. Representation takes a village. It takes effort from everyone, the role models who prove it's possible, the leaders and the managers who set the stage and the colleagues who embrace it. For those of you listening who are in the minority, I see you, I am rooting for you. You can do this. For those of you empowered to change the numbers, Identify the underrepresented talent in your organizations and give them an opportunity to lead. For those of you who work for Black, for Latino colleagues, for women, for anyone in the minority in your world, embrace and accept them. You have more power than you know to help them succeed. I'm here speaking to you today because Finos has made diversity and inclusion a priority. Gab, the Finos leadership team, and my colleagues on the board entrusted me with the responsibility to serve as vice chairman, then chairman of the board during an exciting but really challenging time for our organization. But beyond this one example, we are working to define our diversity and inclusion strategy by setting representation goals for ourselves, for our board of directors, and we'll be reaching out to you, our open source community, to help us grow the number of underrepresented people in our ranks. If even one person reaches out on the back of today, that will be progress. So bear with me through one more story, just one more, uh, later in my career to drive home the point. In November of last year, having recently taken over as the head of Velocity at City. I was asked to present my strategy for the platform to the heads of the trading division and their management team. 20 minutes or so before I was due to speak, I was invited into the room. There were about 40 people in there and a lot of jackets sort of slung over the back of, backs of chairs. The room was almost entirely men. My heart rate absolutely went through the roof. I felt really, really intimidated and nervous, and that's not something I typically feel. Among the senior people in the room was Deidre Dunn, the recently promoted co-head of our global rates business. I was close to Deidre and sent her an email from my phone saying, I am really nervous. I was sitting in a chair by myself, kind of off to the side, away from the conference table. She replied right away saying she totally understood how intimidating the room felt. And she reminded me that I know a lot more about what I was presenting than anyone else in the room and that I was here to teach everybody something. And she kind of nudged me and she said, you should take a seat at the table. You should take a seat at the table, she said. My heart pounded and I pulled up my chair and I found a little spot at the tightly packed table. Thank you. Ali, thank you so much for this inspiring presentation. Um, not only I cherish being able to work with you, but the empathy uh, and the passion that you provide has been invaluable. So thank you so much. Diversity is such an important topic for us moving forward. 
Our next speaker, Alessandro Petroni from our gold member Red Hat and a fellow Italian. Uh, he leads the business and technology strategy to accelerate the adoption of Red Hat open source technologies in the financial services and fintech industry. Additionally, he leads Red Hat in assisting banks and other financial firms to go in the go-to cloud journey. Today, he'll be, take, he'll be talking about how quickly you can deliver modern banking products and services with modularity in, en in the enterprise open source way. Please welcome Alessandro Petroni from Red Hat. Good day. We are here to discuss how can we modernize banks using a modular approach in the open source way. My name is Alessandro Patroni and I lead the strategy for financial services at Red Hat. I'd like to introduce this topic to you and also an experience that we had at Red Hat and other partners in the banking industry, how to tackle this quite difficult problem. So why we are approaching this concept of modularization, if we take an X-ray of the application portfolio in a bank, it's quite complex. We have probably in the range of 10,000 type of different application, highly interconnected with spaghetti integration, 100,000 plus databases where data are difficult to uh, be fetched and reused across the, the, the firm. And also the, the granularity, how these interfaces between applications is being developed over the years is not consistent and is not granular at the same level. Thus the banking industry has been working for the past decade to formulate the business framework from a functional perspective or business capability of the part of the bank, coming out with a blueprint which defines modules that can be eventually reused and recomposed to create business applications. But why are we talking about modules? We've been using modules since ever in the industry, even though we have, we've been using in a different form and shapes. Why? Because we didn't adhere to one framework or business framework, technology framework altogether. That's the opportunity here to work collaboratively, to work at the parts and also the assembly of the solution in order to better provide services to the associate in the bank and also, of course, the customers. And modules are essentially common languages to define boundaries of roles and responsibilities and liabilities, operationally speaking, and then are also um, a particular type of definition of how to access such capability in form of, for example, of open APIs, and furthermore, in a more modern architecture of open eventing, where information flows from inside the bank to outside the bank, from the customer that are behaving and engaging with the bank and other constituencies, and also inside, to detect patterns. So the integration comes in much more loosely coupled way, and eventually all the business functions are somehow listening to what is happening, and they can react to re-engage further, for example, the customer. And the certification and the quality of such componentry and the specification are important to create this kind of modular solutioning. Without the ecosystem participation, of course, it's not possible because the part becomes just basically produced by one and only one um, producer, maybe the bank itself, which doesn't scale. We have been using services in banking for quite a while. AMQP is a technology standard that has actually been built by JP Morgan and eventually open source with the help of Red Hat, but also other standards in the business like FIX for a brokerage and the trading in the FX industry, ISO 222 for payments, down to FDX for customer consent, FDC3, the very standard that we have been creating here at Finos for business in, for desktop interoperability on the trading floor, and also frameworks like the Business Industry Association Network buy-in that has created with the banks in the past 10 years a business framework to define the partition of the bank. But while we're talking about modules, if you take solutions, there seems to be in different domain, that like could be a loan origination versus an e-wallet procurement. If you dig inside, there are certain capabilities and functions that are all basically the very same. 
we need to we need to work with the product category or directory and also we need to deploy the loan or the eWall itself meaning we need to uh, get the loan to the customer or we need to install the e-wallet into the customer's cell phone to start uh, for example um, making a payment open source here comes into many layers so the business layers where companies and partners can build capabilities that stick to the standard and can eventually be plugged into the solution at the bank but also the open source framework itself how these components connect how they are described, how they are looked after, where to find them is very important. And it is important that this framework remains open because it's like the lattice, the framework for the interconnectivity between the players. If we go down into stack, into the technologies where such components are operated, are deployed, are developed, we recognize, of course, open source, starting with languages, with Java, with uh, Kafka for streaming, for example, and moreover down in the infrastructure, the, the de facto frameworks, uh, standard uh, like Linux, and now moreover the cloud world, the Kubernetes framework, which is common to every industry and every, um, and every vendor. But why is important this component mindset? Uh, the idea is that if there is a pool of suppliers that adhere to certain specification, I can have a choice who to shop with and moreover I can always decide to either shop or build or rent the capability elsewhere. So the opportunity here to have a collaboration between fintech and banks is kind of clear but it's very well defined given specific business function. Moreover, from a technology perspective innovation, every function can be implemented in many different ways that does not imply that this function is changing the way it's being consumed by other because the interface is stable. So we might see technology that are connected to legacy mainframe or maybe using very new technology in the hardware space like accelerator like GPUs or maybe even quantum compute for new risk calculation or whatever else. And applications are not even part of the solution deployed at the bank because are consumed as a service over the cloud like could be Salesforce or ServiceNow of the likes. But the best way to explain is to read it by example and creating a proof of concept. So that's what we've done here at Red Hat with the participation of few banks and also FinTech. And we'll build collaboratively one example. We took a process we deemed was important like an e-wallet procurement for a customer wanted to pay using the phone and not cash, which is kind of important during COVID. And so the solution ended up to be uh, composed by four business functions, which are depicted here. And eventually by orchestrating those functions, we created the solution at the end, the aggregation by using um, some web technology. This was important to understand the effort to build application using this capability in a modular fashion. And here is an opportunity to work uh, a little much wider scope in the com in the, at the community level. It is clear that wide problem in the world, like for example, disaster management for, um, for natural disaster is a quite complex business solution that also is the correlation between different, dif different business providers, the bank, maybe a retailer, an insurance company, even the government itself, that comes in the form of regulation and also subsidy to the family that are impacted by a disaster. We model all this using this business uh, architecture methodologies. One by one, we selected all the capability needed to understand the various phases of uh, the recovery, going from you know, in the immediate response of the disaster, all the way down to re-establishing the access where we focused on later on, and all the way back to the new normal after the disaster is gone. How is it possible? Well, first you look at the model from a business perspective, you dissect in the capabilities, you create the various use cases that you want to accomplish, and eventually you, given the use case, you select the business capability and now you start looking at the choreography of the business capability and eventually you lead to defining how um, P 
people can start collaborating because the interfaces between the different components are very clear and the case that we have shown is working with the fintech we were mimicking the bank side and the other team was working as a fintech side and we were essentially only talking about this business capability and exchanges and eventually were was off doing their own implementation independently and then we met again at the interface level and recombine all together look uh, combine a quite compelling application the idea then was to describe what has happened we have been able to create an experience that goes from formulating the business scenario with business analyst and business uh, practitioner down to a technology and business architecture that is eventually translated into component and microservices how to connect them how to build them and eventually how to we deploy them into maybe a construct of a cloud so we use uh, kubernetes openshift red hat which is the implementation in the enterprise, and eventually we ran this application in production using different clouds, and we succeeded doing so. Just to recap, uh, why we should collaborate? Of course, you know, we collaborate because we want to scale faster. The resolution of problem that might be bigger than the boundary of the bank itself or the fintech, and supporting the standardization, standardization and open APIs it creates this consistency between the ecosystem of the industry player to build together. We also reduce the risk because having more people supplying capability and consuming capability, the overall reliability is augmented because we don't depend on the few, but we have a network of support. And of course, more important, we continuously improve using the open source fit up loop to generate new ideas and improve con constantly with requirements and implementation. And moreover, I would say, because we would like to have more fun, working in a community is really awesome. With that, I'd like to conclude seeing how, you can, how can you work with us? Well, you know, you can call Red Hat, you can call Finos, you can also, moreover, contribute your piece, your idea. There are many ways to contribute and everything, since everything and everybody is really uh, important for us and everything matters. And eventually, more important, share your ideas, write, blog, contribute with your code, with your artifact, whatever you feel able to um, consume and uh, contribute. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and I hope you will join this beautiful conference. Thank you, Alessandro, very insightful vision and always a treat to listen to the vision of an open source leader and a great supporter of Finas like Red Hat. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very convinced this community can learn a thing or two from the leading commercial open source vendor in the world. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, creating a lively commercial open source fintech ecosystem is going to be critical to the success of our projects. So I hope the fintech folks in attendance have found that useful. Um, last but not least, moving on with our final speaker of the day, and no, no more Italian accent. Um, our final speaker today is Sarah Novotny, who is with Microsoft in the Azure office of the CDO. Uh, in her recent years, she has focused on open source, cloud, and utility computing, infrastructure automation, and data, big and small, relational and non-relational. Today, She's gonna be talking about some of the enduring lessons of 2020. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Novotny from Microsoft. Hello, and thanks for joining us today. I want to chat about enduring lessons in open source technology more broadly and definitely specifically learned from 2020. So let's just take a moment and have a big breath because 2020 is almost over and it has been a deeply weird year. Doesn't matter where you live or what your interests or persuasions are, this year has been hard. So take a moment with yourself and say, we're almost done. There's a lot of cleanup ahead of us, but we're almost done with 2020. So I wanna talk about people because within 2020, 
I have found that very few of my problems have been technological problems. They've frequently and usually been people problems and people challenges and ways that the people interact with each other and the world that are the hard bit. So let's talk about the world for a moment. This year, this year has been long and hard. And of course, in March, February and March, we were actually uh, hit with the coronavirus and the COVID-19 pandemic. This has led to so much change in the world in the last nine months that we really are struggling with all of these changes. Most of us, many of us are working from home a lot. And that is completely different, making our engagements with our peers, engagements with our projects completely different. And that is something that we really need to understand, especially as we look toward a global workforce that can work on our technological problems around the world with all these different perspectives. Come summer, we found that the US is still deeply, deeply divided and suffering from systemic racism. Well, we found this out. We, many of the privileged white people who are not able to, or not experiencing this challenge on a day to day, are su were suddenly brought to attention for the challenges that are facing our peers and friends and people of color within our communities. That is incredibly important as a thing that we need to work on. We also struggle this year with the fact that global warming is not a little thing. The west coast of the US is on fire and the way fires are behaving is changing because of the problems and challenges with our global climate change. It's tough to say, you know, that this is that this is anything but a global problem when it runs the gamut from fires in the west coast of the US or fires in Siberia to methane escape in the Arctic Circle. And methane does so much more damage than even carbon dioxide to our world. We really need to focus on all of these things. So it's been a rough year. And I hope that most of you have gotten the support and guidance that you've needed, have been able to connect with people at work, felt supported in work, been able to connect with your social circles, your communities that you engage with, and feel supported in those and that you've been able to support other people in this. What I have found in these communities is seeking out someone else's perspective, which is completely different from my own, has strengthened and deepened and opened my eyes to the change that is needed in the world. Learning from people who have different perspectives and then being able to share and grow and interact with those around you who may not have had those same experiences is a way that we can continually improve our world. And we need to be focused on that at this point. In order to make sure that we are impacting things that are important and consistent, we need to make sure that we are measuring things that we want to change, not necessarily measuring second order effects, but measuring directly the changes we need. We need to make sure that we are listening and engaging across differences and making sure that we are able to internalize what we hear. Just listening and trying to respond or trying to argue is not enough. Listening, internalizing, synthesizing, and maybe even changing your own opinions about this, about whatever you're listening to from this different perspective is very important today and empathizing. We need to make sure that everyone's experiences become more equal. Today, my wish to join a person of color or be a person of color in a particular experience would be very low. I recognize that they have a very different experience in the US at least and across some portions of the globe as well but I recognize that they have a very different experience and I have to be empathetic because how they interact, how I interact in a world that has such different experiences is super important. 
it's really important because we want to get back to a world where we can interact with people, where we can be focused on what we are interested in while the rest of the world is moving around us without nearly as much effort and attention as we have had to put into it this year. But that means we need to fix underpinning systemic challenges. We have an incredibly divided world right now. We have a world that is moving more toward nationalism and less toward collaboration in a global economy. That's, that's worrisome. We need to be paying attention and collaborating across those people who are happy with the policies and those people who are unhappy with policies. It's work that needs to be done. And that work is not glamorous. That work is work that we need to do in every one of our communities, open source communities, preschool communities, city communities. And we need to make sure that we are able to and invested in doing the unglamorous work, doing the heavy lifting that change requires. And when we see change that's happening and behaviors that are supporting that change, we need to be sure that we're rewarding those behaviors. We're celebrating the people that are making that change. We're celebrating the way that change is happening. And most of all, in all of this, especially since we are technologists who are building tools and building new ways to engage with the world, we need to make sure our tools cannot be weaponized and that our tools respect privacy and do good in the world. Any tool can become a weapon, but starting from the premise of how to limit any damage created by this tool is also an important ethical consideration as you're developing something. Just because it can be developed, just because it can be a product, doesn't always mean it should be. I'm looking forward to 2021. I think there's a lot of possibility ahead of us. I think there's also a lot of work ahead of us. But I wanted to end on a happy note. I wanted to end saying, whoop, saying respect your privacy for sure. But I wanted to end and go through 21 with a positive note, wherein I wanna say you're amazing. And your amazingness in this world is brought to bear on every decision you make, your team makes, and your communities make around you. So please reach across any divide you see, any challenge you find, any hard conversation that needs to be had, reach across those differences and try to come to some sort of understanding. And if not even understanding, respect for the individual who is presenting that opinion, because we still are humans and human dignity is an important part of our growth through this very difficult year of 2020 and on to the hope and potential of 2021. So my last recommendation for 2021, given the year we've had in the past, is to make sure that, that there is space for fun and novelty, because one of the things that we have been most missing in our year 2020 is the serendipity and novelty of random interactions with friends, with people on the street, with someone in a coffee shop. So be silly, have a bit of fun, go out and do good in the world. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sarah. I definitely couldn't agree more on the fact that open source can bring together folks from all over the world, regardless of the political orientation, race, gender, religion, or whatever you're coming from. And it's largely orthogonal to ongoing relationship within countries. So there's definitely still a lot to do there, but I'm in violent agreement that open source can be a strong unifying force here. So that wraps our today's keynotes. Um, so let me thank you and send a shout out to all the amazing speakers we've had today. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day. I hope you'll be able to follow as many breakout sessions as you can. 
And don't forget the Ask the Expert sessions, uh, which are going to go on uh, 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 later in the day. And remember to visit our sponsor showcase, uh, connect with other attendees, with the Phoenix and Linux Foundation team on the Slack workspace that we set up, uh, and definitely participate in some of the topic-based chat. There's so much uh, going on in our community, so I hope you'll find something interesting and useful to connect on. Finally, join us for our keynotes tomorrow. Um, Tosha Ellison, our COO, will be leading the conversation and share with you all the progress they were doing in our community, in our work with regulators, and more. So thank you so much for attending this morning uh, or afternoon, wherever you are, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.